السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين ونصلي ونسلم على أفضل الخلق أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all his companions May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all and may he bless all those who have struggled and strived from the beginning in a way that the deen has come to us and may he bless us and make us from amongst those who can learn, put into practice and convey the message in a way that our children can also be upon the deen and our progenies to come. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all steadfastness and grant us all acceptance. Amin. We look at a very, very important incident that occurred to one of the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by the name of Salman al-Farisi. And I'm starting this story because some people had asked me about it and we had made mention of Abdullah ibn Salam and how he accepted Islam. And it's important for us to speak about another companion, a great companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was of Persian origin and he accepted Islam. What was his journey? Many lessons to be learned. Salman al-Farisi was from Persia. His father used to worship the fire and he was one of those who was the chiefs of his people. He was a leader and he used to be responsible to ensure that the fire was not turned off or did not go off at all. So Salman al-Farisi as a young boy, his father used to tell him sometimes to go and check that the fire doesn't go off. So he used to go and come and his father loved him a lot. They used to worship the fire. Never did his father allow him to go out and so on. So one day when his father told him, look, you know, go and check the fire and ensure that it is not turned off. Make sure that it stays. And so on. Imagine they worship the fire and they themselves have to make sure that it's lit. Allahu Akbar. Allah safeguard us and protect us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding that he alone is deserving of all acts of worship. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So on his way back, he passed by a monastery, a little place where the priests were. And he decided to go and see what they're doing in the church. So as he went in as a young boy, he watched them, he listened, he witnessed and so on. And he told himself, this is a better religion than my religion. My religion, I'm worshipping the fire. At least these people are worshipping a God, subhanallah. And they have better teachings. And he was right. Christianity, definitely far better religion than worshipping the fire. And at that time, it was the religion because it was the time just after Isa alayhi salatu was salam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam had not yet come. So he decided to listen. When he went back home, he was late. His father asked him, what happened? So he tells his father exactly what happened as a young boy. Look, I think there is a religion better than our religion. And I think that these people have much more sense and they make a lot of sense. We are worshipping the fire. It goes off. We keep it on and so on. His father was very upset, very angry being one of the leaders. So he shackled him and he kept him indoors and he ensured that this child does not interact with the outside world. And it so happened that this increased the love that Salman al-Farisi had for religion and for the search of the truth. And within himself, he said, I am a Christian. I am a person who follows what I saw that evening. And thereafter, he sent message to some of the priests who used to travel up to Asham, you know, the region that includes Jerusalem and Syria and all these places. He sent a message to them saying that whenever there is a caravan going, take me with. You can kidnap me or you can just come and release me and take me with. And he let that message get to them. When they were leaving, caravan was leaving after some time, they picked him up and they took him with. And they took him all the way to Asham where he stayed. And he was very happy. He learned the religion. Imagine he was the son of a very, very influential person, one of the leaders. It did not deter him. So he went and he worshipped. And he noticed that this priest is actually robbing and stealing the charities of the people and eating the wealth of the people. But he kept quiet. He was learning and later on the priest died. When he died, Salman got up and told some of the people, look, this person 
he was actually a traitor he was cheating he was stealing your wealth and I want to show you where he used to hide it and when he took them and showed them they they then crucified this priest of theirs and they decided this man was a very bad man we don't want to give him a proper burial and they they were actually very very upset and thereafter they appointed a very very good pious man as their leader and he was indeed a very good priest and he taught Christianity Salman al Farisi learned a lot when he died another one came in fact when he died Salman al Farisi went to him and told him you were such a good man and you know I learned so much from you and you are on such a level of piety after you die who should I go to so he was shown go to such and such a person and then the other one died and he was shown to go to another one and so on and in this way he was then told by one of the priests that look you as a young boy if you are given life you will see the prophet who is coming and he is going to come in an area that is between the two deserts the two the rocky deserts which has date palms and he described Medina Munawwara so Salman was a young boy he had hardly anything because obviously he'd given up his home he'd given up everything and he was here learning the religion and following Christianity it so happened that he sent a message to some of the Arabs that if you are going into the Arabian Peninsula please take me with and uh, then they surely took him with and he gave them whatever little he had for the transport but sadly when they got to the middle of the desert they changed their tune they decided to enslave this man and they enslaved Salman al Farisi took him captive and sold him to some people so who purchased him a Jewish man purchased him and gave him as a gift to his nephew and this is all the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala imagine a free man being enslaved and this was the pagan Arab time when they used to enslave anyone who was weak and who didn't have family or clan to protect him or her they used to enslave them so when they enslaved this man and sold him to the Jewish man who then gave him to his nephew the nephew was from a place known as Yathrib Yathrib was Medina Munawwara subhanallah now Salman al-Farisi comes and Salman al-Farisi came to al Madinah al-Munawwara and he was enslaved working in the garden and working in the orchard and so on and he had his master who was a Jewish man now the last priest who met Salman al-Farisi told him that the messenger who is going to come he has many signs from amongst them he will not eat a charity if you give him a charity he won't eat from it and if you give him a gift he will eat from it and if you notice on his back he will have a mark a seal of prophethood that is the sign it's slightly bigger than a P and it is at the back on his back just below that shoulder blade or just nearby there so Salman al Farisi he had heard this and subhanallah he was waiting and at the same time one day as he was busy working he heard his master being told by another man who was also Jewish that do you know that these people of Medina they have now met up with someone whom they are calling a prophet and he is going to come here to Medina Munawwara and at the moment he is in Quba and he is coming to Medina so Salman dropped whatever he was doing and he was in awe and what did he ask what did you say there is a prophet who is coming here subhanallah they told him you carry on with what you're doing who told you to ask questions here no questions asked you are a slave carry on doing what you have to and so he continued but when the Prophet ﷺ came Salman al-Farisi in his little time that he had had he went and he started checking he looked he saw he asked questions and so on and he gave a gift he gave a charity in fact he gave something to the Rasulullah ﷺ, and he said this is a charity for you the Prophet ﷺ did not eat from it he didn't eat from it and then he came back and said wait hang on I gave you something and I said by mistake that it's a charity it wasn't a charity it's just a gift then he ate from it so this he, he told himself these are two signs did not eat the charity and he ate the gift from the gift then one day it is reported that he noticed when the Prophet ﷺ was uh, assisting in some carrying a janazah or something of that nature and he noticed on his back subhanallah that yes there is a seal of prophethood here exactly as described and this is when Salman al-Farisi declared aloud that I bear witness 
that there is none worthy of worship but Allah and that you are the messenger whom we are all waiting for. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the understanding. So this was Salman al-Farisi. Look at his journey and look at what had happened. One more issue. He was still a slave. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Ya Salman, why don't you buy yourself, buy your freedom. So there was a certain amount the Jewish man had asked for. One narration of the historians make mention, makes mention of the fact that he said, I would like 300 date palms. So you need to sow those for me and make sure that they grow. It was very difficult at that time because they would plant and when it grows, a lot of them would die because of adverse weather conditions and so on. So what happened? The Prophet ﷺ told him, Oh Salman, the little amount that you have of gold, you can sell it and you will get a certain amount of silver that this man is asking for. And if you were to dig these uh, little holes so that we can come in and we will plant, I will plant these for you. I will put the seeds myself. And Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came through according to one narration and he put all those seeds, not a single one of them died. All 300 had grown. Salman al-Farisi was a free man. And this is the man, the same man whom during the battle of the trench, it was his view to actually dig the trench around parts of Medina Munawwara to protect it from the enemy as they used to do in Persia. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and grant us understanding. Now we get to Medina Munawwara and the condition of the people. There were in Medina Munawwara several categories of people when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had come in. We made mention of the building of the masjid and the little piece of land that he had purchased from the two orphans of Bani Najjar. And thereafter he had immediately studied the people in Medina Munawwara and he found the following. They were the believers who came from Makkah al Mukarramah. And these believers who came from Makkah al Mukarramah, they were known as Al Muhajirin. They were removed from their homes. They, their property was stolen in most cases by the people of Quraysh. Their homes were also stolen, usurped, and so on. And they were all truthful people. There were no hypocrites from amongst the Muhajirin. And one of the reasons was that a lot of sacrifice was required in order to be a Muslim in Makkah. So it was difficult for a one who wanted to be a Muslim to be a Muslim, but it was not difficult for he who did not want to be Muslim to remain as a non-Muslim. So it was only those with sincere hearts whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says were the muhajireen. And this is why in the Quran Allah praises them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِلْفُقَرَاءِ الْمُهَاجِرِينَ الَّذِينَ أُخْرِجُوا مِنْ دِيَارِهِمْ وَأَمْوَالِهِمْ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ يَبْتَغُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرِضْوَانًا وَيَنْصُرُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ Allah says, as for those who made hijrah, the poor people who had made hijrah, the muhajireen, those who have been driven out of their homes and their wealth was usurped and they had made hijrah for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, they are the truthful. They are the ones who are the truthful. You won't find a hypocrite from amongst them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness and may he make us truthful as well. And thereafter, the next category of people from amongst the Muslims were the Ansar. The Ansar were the people of Medina Munawwara who opened their arms and who opened their homes and who opened whatever they had had in terms of welcome to welcome these people who had come to welcome the messenger and to offer protection of the highest degree in the same way they protected themselves and their family members. This was the second category of people. The third category of people were those who were mushriks and they had still not accepted Islam. They remained on the religion of their forefathers from amongst the Arabs. And these were some of the people of Medina Munawwara and they were also there. The next category of people were the Jewish clans mainly made up of three of them. Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir and Banu Quraida. As for Banu Qaynuqa, they were within Medina Munawwara. And the other two, Banu Nadir and Banu Quraida, they were on the outskirts of Medina Munawwara. And these people were people of the book. They were very, very intelligent people. 
they subhanallah banu qaynuqa and banu nadir they had treaties with khazraj treaties of protection with khazraj and as for banu quraida they had a treaty with al aws so if anyone attacks us you know you will come and we will protect each other together and so on that's the type of a treaty that they had had and the Jewish people were the business people of the area. They are the ones who controlled the buying and selling of the dates and so on. They were very, very intelligent. They dealt in interest. They were the ones who uh, controlled the alcoholic market, the market of beer and alcohol and wines and so on. These people, although they were not so many in number, they were controlling the marketplace, subhanallah. And it is reported that one of the ways of controlling was to give the leaders loans which were returnable with a great amount of interest. So they were always indebted to them. So they had wealth, they would give it. They did not charge interest amongst themselves, never. But they would charge it to others in order to make them indebted, especially the leaders. So once the leader of a nation or a group is indebted to people whom he owes double, triple, quadruple, he will be enslaved forever and ever. If you take a look at the economic laws of the globe today as well, it operates more or less on similar lines. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never enslave us economically. So this was what was going on at that particular time. When Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam came, he had to deal with these crises as soon as possible. Because on one hand, the kuffar of Quraysh, they were still gobsmacked. They did not know what struck them. They had an idea, but they still did not digest fully what exactly occurred. Although there was a lot of talking and bubbling, subhanallah. So in the meantime, the first thing done by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was something known as al-mu'akhah, bayn al-muhajirina wal-ansar. He created a brotherhood and a link between the families of the muhajirin and the families of the ansar. What this meant is every household from amongst the people of Medina had to take in a household from amongst the people of Mecca and they had to treat them as real brothers subhanallah as family members and even more and we will come to see some of what was dictated by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so what had happened a miracle happened because there would have been a great refugee crisis if this did not take place but divine revelation the instruction of the messenger he says Look, we don't want to fight. You cannot choose who is going to go into your home. We will pick it up and we will draw, as we said the other day, lot. The names were drawn and the next person in line would take that particular family and continue. What were they to share? Number one, their wealth was to be shared half, half. Whatever you have, give half and you will keep half. Subhanallah. Another thing, inheritance. If anyone had died from amongst them, this one from Makkah would inherit the one from Medina as though he was one of the family members subhanallah so it was something amazing so the ansar they told muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that look we love what has happened so much so that we are people who are farmers and we've got lots of what is known as nakhil the date palms so why don't you share even our little farms that we have half half between us and the muhajirin Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, no, not that. Subhanallah. One wonders why. But let's listen to what he said. He then said, meaning the, the Ansar then made a second offer. And they said, okay, let them help us when it comes to the labor and the looking after it and so on. And we will share the prophets half half. Then he agreed and he said, yes, that is fine. Subhanallah. So why didn't he agree that the farms went half half? Because the Ansar were farmers, they knew a lot about how to farm, but the Muhajirin knew nothing about farming. So if they had to take the farms, there would be no production and the produce would be low. So rather than that, keep it in the hands of the experts, subhanallah. But strike the deal where half, half. This is the solution of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet was to be shared half, half, but on the ground, the expert were the Ansar and the helpers who came to assist were the muhajirin subhanallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson from this it is a powerful solution that did not spoil the economy of the muslims of medina munawwara not at all and the ansar were not affected by it nor were the muhajirin and anyone else this was the solution of muhammad ibn abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
we need to make mention some of the companions and whom they were paired up with as brothers. Very important for us to know some of them at least. So one of the most important people, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he was paired up with a man from amongst the Ansar known as Kharijah ibn Zuhair radiallahu anhu. So that was his brother and it was, he was known as Akhihi, a brother of his being fostered, being made a brother because of hijrah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the love for one another. And then Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he was made a brother of Itban ibn Malik radiallahu anhu from amongst the Ansar. Abu Ubaid Amir ibn al-Jarrah was made a brother of Sa'd ibn Mu'ad. And remember, they couldn't choose who they wanted to be with. It was just their luck. And this was the choice made by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for them. Zubair ibn al-Awwam radiallahu anhu was, sala was with Salamah ibn Salama radiallahu anhu who was a member for, of the Ansar. As for Talha ibn Ubaidillah, he was with Ka'b ibn Malik. Ka'b ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, we will get to hear more about him when we get to the battle of Tabuk, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a lesson. These were all the uh, helpers of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sa'id ibn Zayd was with one of the reciters of the Quran from amongst the Ansar who had a beautiful voice and his recitation was so clear. Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu. So much so that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to love to listen to the recitation of Ubay ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us even a portion of that clarity and that type of recitation and may Allah accept it from us. Then Mus'ab ibn Umair radiallahu anhu, mashallah, Mus'ab ibn Umair, the one from Makkah al mukarramah whose family was quite wealthy and yet he was expelled from them. He was paired up with Khalid ibn Zayd al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. And as for Ammar ibn Yasir, who was the slave whose family had been martyred in Makkah, he was paired up with Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman. Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu was that companion who narrated most of the prophecies of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was gifted by Allah that he, he bore in mind the prophecies of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To this day, we look at the prophecies one by one coming true. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Most of these narrations of Al-Fitan, they were narrated by Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu. And then you have Abu Dhar al-Ghifari radiallahu anhu who was also considered a muhajir. He had made the hijrah. He was paired up with al-Mundhir ibn Amr. And as for Abdurrahman ibn Awf, he was with Sa'd ibn al-Rabi' radiallahu anhuma. And then I want to end with one beautiful story and making mention of two of these companions who were wonderful people. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, the man we spoke about from Persia, who was enslaved and so on, he was paired up with a person from, uh, he was paired up with Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. And what happened is, Salman al-Farisi had had a lot of knowledge. And his knowledge, they used to call him a person who has gathered between Christianity and Islam. Which means he had both books. He had read the scriptures of the uh, Christians and he followed Christianity quite rigidly and thereafter he was a Muslim he had accepted Islam so Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu he was with Abu Darda radiallahu anhu and he noticed that Abu Darda was very very pious so pious that sometimes he would forget some of his other rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ordained so when he came home he noticed the wife of Abu Darda, she would never ever dress in a way that would be of attraction to her own husband. Now this, there was a relation between them. So this is why there was speech between them. Otherwise, there would be no speech between them. But there was a solid relation. And obviously the speech was with respect, utmost respect. And at that time still, the laws of hijab were not as strict as later on. So what had happened is, Salman al-Farisi asked her, what is wrong? What is wrong? It seems like you, there is, you know, you, your dress code is quite tatty and so on. She says, well, your brother Abu Darda, he doesn't even really look in our direction. He doesn't have any need in this dunya, which means what rights of his wife does he ever fill? He doesn't even look in that direction. Let's pause for a moment. How many of us are guilty of that? Wallahi, it's a fact. We have our wives and we don't give them importance. 
And sometimes we don't look at them with an eye of appreciation. And sometimes we don't utter words of love and words of appreciation that can make them feel all the reason to be people who, who take pride in their dress code because of their husbands. Sadly, today, we have turned everything upside down. So you find a woman dresses when she leaves the house rather than for her husband in the home. Why? Because the world appreciates her, but we don't back at home. This is also the problem. So this is why it's important for us to know in Islam, it's supposed to be the other way around. Appreciation should be within the home such that subhanallah, the dress code is the most magnificent, most attractive dress within the house. And when we leave the home, we are covered. Alhamdulillah, we don't want others to see our wives in the same way that we wouldn't like to sit and start glaring at someone else's wife. Subhanallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us not to look at that which we don't even own, doesn't belong to us. And subhanallah, by looking at others, we do not appreciate what we have. That's one of the secrets or should I say one of the benefits of dressing appropriately is that if we were all to dress appropriately, like the women folk, for example, all of them were to dress appropriately. What would the men have to compare their wives with? Nothing at all. Today there is nakedness. So no matter how pretty your wife is, you will always bump into someone even prettier Then you don't appreciate what you have at home. But you're not going to get that anyway. So what happens? You are caught in the middle. You die a sad man. Allahu Akbar. Because neither did you make use of what you have, nor did you ever get what you wished for. Allahu Akbar. We'd rather be people who appreciate what we have and be honest. So Salman al Farisi, powerful words. He decided, let me correct Abu Darda. Because one of the points of agreement was that we need to advise one another. We teach one another. The people who have come, the Muhajireen, they have knowledge. They will be teaching the Ansar. Look at how powerful it was. So the Ansar helped them in terms of dunya. And the Muhajireen helped the Ansar in terms of the Akhirah in the sense that they had more Quran, they had more knowledge, they would all teach and there was a teacher in the home automatically. Subhanallah. So Salman al-Farisi, when Abu Darda came back, the food was prepared and he told Abu Darda, let's sit down to eat. Abu Darda says, I'm fasting. So Salman al-Farisi says, well, I'm not going to eat until you eat. So you'd better break it. Subhanallah. And Abu Darda looks at him and then he broke his fast and he began to eat. He began to eat. So obviously there must have been something in his heart, in the heart of Abu Darda to say, well, I'm in a fix here. I'm going to see what the messenger says about this later on. But when the evening came, he had not yet seen the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he was standing in salah. He wanted to stand in the voluntary prayer, extra prayer. So as he is standing, Salman al-Farisi comes up to him and says, go to bed and made sure that he went to bed. Nam. And after some time, he noticed that this man got up again. Abu Darda got up again and he wanted to start his salah again. So Salman al-Farisi says, go to bed again the second time. And thereafter, when a third of the night was remaining, he got Abu Darda up and he says, you can now fulfill your salah. You can now pray. Then he says, Oh Abu Darda, let me teach you something. You have a duty unto your Rabb. You have a duty unto yourself. You have a duty unto your family and so on. So fulfill the right of everyone. Don't overdo one at the price or at the expense of the other. So this Abu Darda radiallahu anhu heard it. He understood it. But in the morning, he went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him, hey, this is what happened. Firstly, the fast I had to eat. Secondly, the man tells me to sleep and not to pray. And thirdly, he comes to give me some speech and he told me that you have a right or Allah has a right over you. And so does your own body have a right over you. And so does your family have a right over you. So fulfill the rights of everyone. What is the meaning of this? Your body has a right. You need to rest. You need to sleep. You need to eat. You need to make sure that you look after this body, which is an amana, which is a trust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you were not to eat, not to rest, you get sick. 
When you are sick and ill, how are you going to pray? So you'd rather be a balanced person. The same applies to your Rabb. You can pray, mashallah, but not at the expense of your own health because then tomorrow you won't be able to pray. What's the point of doing everything today? It's like us. Sometimes we feel pious, so we sit with the Quran for two hours. And then for two months, we didn't even see one page. It happens. We sit in the month of Ramadan and mashallah, we make ibadah such that people then think that, you know what, for the whole month, now I don't have to make ibadah or for the whole year, sorry, I now don't have to pray. You know, on a lighter note, something comes to my mind. There was once a lady who had come visiting and there was a wedding that she was going to be participating in. So she was making wudu, one wudu, two wudu, three wudu, four wudu, five wudu. And so she was asked, what are you doing? She says, no, three, four days, I'm not going to get a chance to make wudu. So I'd rather make 10, 15 now. And then when one breaks, what will happen is I'll still have another few. Allah Akbar. It doesn't work that way. You make wudu when the time comes. You can't read all your salah today and say right now for the month, I'm not going to be able to read. So I'd rather just read everything. So this is what Abu Darda was being told in a much more beautiful way to say that this is the right. Your spouse, your family has a right. If you don't smile at your wife, what you want the neighbor to come and quickly smile at her. Allah protect us. If you do not talk to her with good words, who do you want to talk to her with good words? And I better also say the other side of it because people nowadays also suffer the other way. The women need to know that if they are not going to be the sweetest to their own husbands, then there will be others out there who may be sweet to them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from shaitan. Really. So when you fulfill the rights of one another properly, you resolve your matters without even realizing. Today, we want to over punish. Even when we punish our own children sometimes or admonish them, sometimes we overdo it. The same applies to our spouses. If they've done something wrong, we get so excited that we've made a mountain out of a little molehill. Let me quickly inform you, subhanallah. When we get married, if the spouse makes one mistake, does that mean the marriage must end? No, the previous generations used to help each other through difficulty. With us today, one difficulty, the person wants out. No, I'm going. Why? Because there's one problem. How foolish is that? If we had to break marriages because of a problem or a difficulty, everyone's marriages would be broken because everyone has gone through some difficulty or some problem. So foolish are those who want to break their marriages because of one, two little issues. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us realize that a spouse is all about support and marriage is all about sacrifice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors, make us the best of people. Remember, don't be from amongst those who loses the family life and at the same time, they are vying for something which they will never ever get because they're just looking and wishing. Allahu Akbar. May Allah protect us. We need to lower our gaze and work on our conditions and our family members and we will achieve the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells Abu Darda two words. Sadaqa Salman. Over. Salman has spoken the truth. That's it. Imagine after the whole story was put in front of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he just said Salman has spoken the truth. Now the reason I raise this is to show you that even amongst ourselves, we need to help each other where people are going wrong. And at the same time, don't feel bad when someone corrects you, when someone rectifies my brother, do you know what I noticed this and that may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala grant us goodness. And these were the, the, the type of people the Muhajireen and Ansar were they developed and subhanallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted them a lot and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened their doors in the dunya as well as in the akhirah. So the issue of inheritance where they used to inherit from one another that came to an end when the verses were revealed where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says when that verse was revealed, meaning that your family members and those who are related to you are closer to you in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than those who made the hijrah. When that verse was revealed, referring to inheritance, then the inheritance between the muhajireen and ansar had stopped at that particular point. So this was as far as the brotherhood and the relation had gone. It worked so well. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum who had come from Makkah to Mukarramah, many of them were business people. And the Ansar, they knew much about their farming and so on. So these business people, 
instead of taking handouts, a lot of them said, show us where the marketplace is. They went to the marketplace, they came back at the end of the day with much more than had, ex had been expected, subhanAllah. So they did not depend on hands out, handouts. Experience the power of uninterrupted viewing with our ad-free app, One Islam TV, allowing you to connect deeply with the content. Explore the rich teachings of Islam and strengthen your faith through our regular new content. Download the One Islam TV app now. Thank mm -hmm. you.